Amen, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We thank you this morning. For your word says where two or more are gathered in your name, the precious name of Jesus, Father, you enter in. And your word says that you enter into the worship and praise of your people. And we've come to worship and praise you. But, Father, we're also people that want to hear from heaven. We hear every day for the things of this world. But, Father, we've come to sit at your feet to hear from you this morning. Because we know that your Holy Spirit lives inside each and every one of us that have been transformed into a new creation. We've been made new. We are the image of the invisible God in Christ Jesus. We are your church. We are your body. We are your hands, your feet, your mouthpiece, your eyes, your ears. Father, use us in a mighty way. As we see these last days, these times of evil things start growing. Father, may we understand that we're called to put on the armor of God. That we're called to stand. And when we've done all to stand, stand. Praising the world. Praising God. Praising Jesus. Giving you worship and thanks for all that you're doing in and through our lives. No matter what we see, hear, taste, or feel. Father, we hear your word. We know your word because you've put your word in us. And Father, we know the truth. And we thank you for that truth. And Father, today as we continue to hear from heaven, to hear from you, Holy Spirit, I yield my spirit to you, none of me and all of you. Let it be your words they hear. Let it be your heart that they hear. And may it change our hearts. May it open our eyes to see more of Jesus, to be more like Jesus, to be the light as he is in the light, he is the light. Father, we are called to be light. Let us be your light as we walk day by day, serving, honoring, glorifying, exalting, shouting hallelujah. Holy, holy is the Lamb of God. And we do this all in the precious name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. You may uh, say how do's and do a little toe tap for just a minute. Well, good morning, good morning, good morning, and again, and again, and again, I say good morning. It's a great time to be in the house of the Lord, to come and hear from God today. I pray it will be word of, of understanding, so that you too can walk as God has intended us to walk, not as slaves, but as free. Amen? Amen. Don't y'all worry, they'll hush in a minute. For those of you that are listening, I want to thank you all for joining us here today. And especially, I thank you for the, the honor that you put upon not only my wife and I and, and Pastor Debbie, but there are the other pastors as well, Pastor Frank and, and Marilyn and uh, Eric and Allison, uh, who are such strong, not only teachers, but equippers. I love that word, that we're called to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And uh, as uh, Pam was sharing this morning, that the need for laborers, you know, the Bible tells us that the, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are very few. You think God knew something? You think God is trying to tell us something? Why is it that when God's church is so huge, there's such few laborers to go out and do the work of ministry. And uh, not that all are called to be pastors. We all understand that because that's scriptural as well. Paul teaches that. We're not all called to be pre preachers. We're not all called to be te teachers. But we are called to ministry. Amen? And we have some great people that we don't classify as pastors. But let me tell you, they are great ministers. 
as we have food in the afternoon after our service, we have people that set up the chairs and the tables and, and bring the sound equipment in and set it up. There's all kinds of ministry that is taking place before your very eyes that many of us don't even really recognize. And so I do recognize those that have that ministry of helps and reaching out and exhorting and lifting up other people. I thank each and every one of you for what you do do in our church. Amen. This morning, I'd like to share something with, uh, with you, and I've titled it this, Faith is Not Head Knowledge. See, it's not what we know up here, it's what we know in here. And it was amazing when Pam came up and said, you know, what scripture she was going to read, and I'm going, well, that's exactly what my message is about, because I haven't shared it with her, because uh, I didn't know what it was going to be until yesterday afternoon. And so it was, uh, it was not something that I practiced on her. In fact, I never do that. <laughs> it's just something, uh, it's just the way it is. But faith is not a head knowledge, it's a heart knowledge. It's a choice to believe what the Word of God says it is. Is it truth? And we take that by faith. The Word of God is true. It says it's true. There is no way that God can lie. God cannot lie. He cannot deceive. He cannot do the things that Satan does. He cannot do the things that we do because he is love, because he is almighty God. He is all-knowing. He is all-trustworthy. He is all-grace. I mean, all-mercy. The list goes on and on of, that d tells the story of who God is. And we've been told stories all our life from the pulpits, from our teachers, our Sunday school teachers. That God doesn't do certain things. But it's not in the word of God. So what's in the word of God, we need to learn to take by faith. We need to put it in our heart and let the abundance of our heart, the mouth speaks. Amen? I read a quote by Smith Wigglesworth. He said it this way. I'm not moved by what I see. And I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm moved only by what? I believe. So I stand, or I'm sorry, so stand your ground on what you believe. What do you believe? Do you believe the word of God to be true? Then stand your ground. What the word says is true. No matter what somebody else says, no matter what you've learned in the past, the word of God is true. It is the truth and nothing but the truth. Amen? I'm moved not by what I see. I'm not moved by what I feel. See, that's the soul man of us that has been so active in our life. That's where our mind, will, and emotion is. So we have to control the things that our mind brings in and take. See, they need to be lined up with the word of God, the word, our spirit man, that new creation, that transformation that has taken place. It all resides here, not in the soul man, but it's the spirit man, the new creation that one that's been transformed, he is to teach the soul now, this is how we're operating. Not the way we used to, not the way we used to think, not the way we used to speak, not the way we used to dress. I'm a new creation. I am Christ because Christ is in me. Each one of you are a image of Christ. How do we sound? Do we sound like Christ? Do we walk like Christ? Do we love like Christ? Turn with me to a, a book that you all know, Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to read verses 10 through 16. Like I said, it's one you all know. It's called the armor of God. And Paul is such a great teacher in teaching us what God has provided. This is not something you earn. You can't earn this. It's a gift. It's a free gift. And it becomes a choice of whether we put it on or leave it at home. And some of it we'll take with us and some of it we'll leave at home. I pray today as we learn and study this and look at the understanding, it's not about my head knowledge, it's about my heart knowledge. And I want to be more like Jesus. I want to live more like Jesus. I want to sound more like Jesus. Amen. So let's start beginning there in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of what? His might. 
Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, <laughs> having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And, first, and verse 16 says, above all, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Amen? I mean, do you hear what Paul is saying here, what we've been teaching over the years? I pray today you'll get a new revelation, a new understanding of the importance of God's gifts. He has given us gifts, many different gifts. We read of spiritual gifts. We read, read of a, a spiritual blessings. We've been talking over the last few weeks about the covenant promises of God that never end. They're all eter they're eternal promises. That's something we need to understand in our spirit, man, and allow that soul, man, to understand I'm no longer of this world. I'm in it, but I'm not of it. I want to operate out of that spirit, man, that new creation that reveals and speaks and does and honors God in everything we do and say. Look at verse 10. Finally, listen to this. Finally. My brethren, be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. See, the great part about this, we understand it's all him. See, all I'm called to do is stand strong in the Lord. In other words, have faith in this word. Whatever the word says is mine to hold on to and mine to put into action in my life. And I won't have to worry about how my life is going to end up because I'm going to do it to glorify and honor and praise the name of Jesus, to allow people to see Jesus in me, in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord. Look at verse 11. Put on the whole armor. So he doesn't say just take your salvation, your helmet of salvation, and put it on. It's talking about the whole armor. See, this armor of God is a free gift. It's God's gift to you and I. But we have to watch Look at the first two words in verse 11. What does that say to you and I? Make a choice. Put it on or don't. You either receive the results of putting armor on. Just think about being a combat soldier. Many of us in here are veterans. Just think about if you went to war with a pea shooter. And in your Bermuda shorts and a tank top. First of all, would the enemy be concerned about how strong you are? No, all they got to do is look at you and they see their weakness. We're going to learn a little bit more about this and understanding this, this warfare that we're in. Yes, we understand physical warfare, but what about this spiritual warfare? And can I see my, can you see my armor? I have my helmet of salvation on. I have my breast, breastplate of righteousness and, and all the way down to my feet being shod. See, even, even the lower part of the body is being protected. In fact, if you know anything about warfare in the back days of the time of Paul and them, when these Roman soldiers would go to war, they had sandals with spikes on them. Do you know why they had spikes on their sandals? I mean, we put on our, what we used to call in the 70s, Jesus shoes, and we walk around. But there's no grip. There's nothing there to keep me from sliding. There's nothing there that holds me in place. But when you put spikes, like a football player has cleats. Baseball players have cleats. Why? To give them firm traction, to hold them in place, to be able to move quickly, to grip the ground. 
That's the way our feet should be shod. And understanding that, what has been given? What, is, what have we been equipped with? But it says, first of all, you must put it on. God didn't put it on you. He gave it to you to put on. And you and I need to put it on. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may. See, here's where that choice comes in. Whether you put it on or don't put it on is whether you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So when Satan comes, and by the way, he's going to come. As soon as you are transformed, as soon as you are made a new creation in Christ Jesus, he's coming for you. You know why? Because God has taken his word, his living word, and placed it in you. And he's coming after the word. He's not after you. He's not after this flesh. He's after my word. He's a thief. And he comes to steal the word that is in me and in you. That's what he's after. This is the importance of understanding all of this armor that God has placed in our our care that we need to go and, and understand. You never know when the battle's coming. You know, when, when we were, when I was in Vietnam, you never knew. It was different than World War II. There was no front line. I mean, war was all around you. It could be in a little boy with a shoeshine kit. It could be a, a girl coming in asking for candy, and there's, there's stuff attached to her that will kill and maim five or six guys. So you never knew where, where it's the, the start and finish was of war. You always had to be on the alert. And this is more of what God is showing us in, in, this, in these scriptures is that we need to be on the alert. We need to be ready whenever it comes because it is coming. It's not a matter if, it's a matter of when. Amen? So put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. God did not just provide us with armor. He gave us his armor. Did you hear that? It's his armor. Do you have faith in his armor? Well, then put it on. Why would you ever leave home without it? Isaiah 59, 17 reflects this because even in the Old Testament, it specifies, it mentions that the Messiah will come wearing the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness. So it was already being prepared long before you and I became a Christian. Look at verse 12. This is something we have a hard time understanding, that our, our battle is not in the physical. It's not like getting on a plane and going to Vietnam or going to uh, Iraq or now over into Poland to stand your ground. It, it's, not, it's not that. We go every day, we are bombarded by spiritual activity. It's going on constantly, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because they don't know what time is. They're not affected by time. You and I are. But even when we sleep, our mind is still at work. So what have we put in our mind that allows us to rest in the Word of God? Or is it all about the activities of the day and the problems of this world and of our government and everything else? Do we go to bed with that thought on our mind where our mind never rests? That's where our rest is. It says rest in the Word. Have faith in the Word. But it says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. See, you can't go to battle with Satan. You can't go to battle with the things that try to come at you, that try to deceive, steal, and, con and destroy what is God has given us. It's against what? Look at, look at what it says. I, ne I need you to put your eyes on this. Verse 12, it says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities. Show me one. Come on, bring it up. Show me. Hold it up. You can't because you can't see it. Principalities. Now watch this. Against powers. Against the rulers of darkness. Against spiritual hosts. Do you see where the war takes place? Do you see what Paul is warning us about? See, it's not about this physical thing. It's about the spiritual warfare that's going on. That's where the warfare is really taking place. And it's taking place so that he can steal, kill, and destroy what God has already provided. But see, if we choose to leave home, if we choose not to put this armor on, we're going to get it. 
and it's going to hurt. It doesn't mean that we're not going to have trials and tribulations because Jesus said, you're going to have them. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. And by the way, I've given you my armor. You can't see it, but Satan can. Did you hear that? See, you don't, it's not like you go over and put your football helmet on and your, your, your shoulder pads and your knee pads and your, you know, your, your girdle in here with the pads on your hips and stuff like that. No, no, no. It's not like that. See, we put on this armor because we're ready for warfare. And it's spiritual. It's not physical. It's the darkness of this age that is fighting against the spiritual hosts of wickedness. There is a wickedness of these spiritual hosts that is going on. We know, according to the word, that the, there are angels doing battle constantly. Aren't you so excited? That, that should make your heart just leap with excitement to know that you God has placed angels, warriors, not just a angel, but a warrior angel on your side to do battle for you. You remember what happened when Daniel, when Daniel prayed the first time, instantly. Second time, 21 days later. Why? Because there was a battle going on. And it took a warrior angel to come and do battle so that the angel could bring the answer to the prayer that was already answered 20 days, 21 days before that. Ooh, glory. So this threat, this threat that you and I deal with, this threat that is going on, whether you're a believer or not, let me tell you something, it's still going on. Whether you believe in the spirit world or not, the fight is still going on. Because God knows those who will and those who will not come to him. And so those of you that haven't or those that are, or that are out there that haven't, there's still a battle going on so that as you and I, the, the army of God, as we minister to people, as we share the word with people, as we love on people, the movement of God, the Holy Spirit can move and open their eyes. Open our eyes, Lord. We sing that song as believers. But we also need to have our eyes open to those that are hurting out there. And to love on them like Christ loved. To take this armor in there. And then reveal God's great love and God's great message of love. Look at verse 13. As we're reminded, 12 there, everything that we're dealing with is unseen. You cannot touch it. Therefore, here it comes again. Here is another important part. You remember back there in verse uh, 11, it says what? Put on the armor of God. Now look what 13 says. Take up. Is this a reminder? You bet it is. It's coming back a second time. Don't forget your armor. Don't leave home without it. You know, the, 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 the advertisement for insurance for your cars. Don't leave home without it. Take up the whole armor of God. Not parts of it. All of it. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day. See, when it comes... It's coming, you're coming under attack. These evil days, they're an attack against the church. They're attacked against God's goodness. They're an attack against God's, uh, 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 God's person of who he is. We no longer pray in school. We're no longer, now they want to take prayer out of the Capitol building down here in, uh, in, 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 in Boise. No more prayer before a meeting. In fact, they want to take the uh, salute of the flag out too. It might hurt somebody's feelings. And they'll get away with it if good people do nothing. <laughs> because we are fighting a spiritual battle, according to uh, verse 12 there, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. See, it's not something, I mean, I know how to handle a big guy like this cowboy sitting right here. If he was to come at me, I know what I have to do. But we're not talking about the physical, something you can touch and, and look at and see and watch his moves and everything. You can't see it. But your spirit can. Are we being spirit-minded? Are we being led by the spirit? Do we hear the spirit? Do we hear the voice of God when he speaks? 
He will tell us good news. He will tell us those things that are coming at you. He will prepare us for what's coming. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Physical defenses are useless. So if you put on your football helmet and your shoulder pads and your hip pads and your knee pads and all the rest of those pads, when it comes to spiritual warfare, they don't work. They never will work. They never have worked. It's only in the physical that they work. We must have God's armor to vend ourselves. So put it on. And my recommendation, don't take it off. Look at verse 14. Stand therefore having, here again, you've got to read the words. What do these words mean? When it says having, look at that verse 14 there. Stand therefore having girded your waist. So it's saying that you already have. See, that word have mean is past tense. It's something you've already prepared for. You've already done it. They're already in place. It says having uh, uh, prepared, girded your waist with truth, having, here again, here it comes, again, already made ready, put on the, bri- on, the, on the breastplate of righteousness. Having, already, that's what it says to me. I've already done it. We should already have it in place. Don't wait till the battle comes and then go looking for your armor. It's too late. That's like going into a fight with and leaving your gun at home. Or your knife, or your pea shooter, whatever it might be. See, if, we, if it's a part of our warfare, if it's part of the equipment that we've been given in order to fight the good fight, then we need to have it already in place, not left at home. And, oh, hey, hang on. Hang on, Satan. Hey, hey, hang on, hang on. I, I, I know what you're up to. Let me go home and get it. <laughs> that might work in today's world, but it doesn't work in the spiritual world. Because Satan already knows your weakness. He already knows what you lack. See, because it's spiritual. The new, uh, in, the new International Version translates this way. Uh, as your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Then look at verse 16. That's on uh, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. See, we need to already be fitted. It's not something I go home to put on a different pair of shoes. I'm going out tomorrow to stand on the corner or go and witness to somebody. So I got to put on my shod feet of the gospel. Well, come on. Does that make sense? No, absolutely not. So why did you take them off to begin with? And it's just like that with the rest of it. Look at verse 16. Above all, above all. Let me say it again. Above all. Above all the rest of this. Now, that doesn't mean you leave all the rest of it at home. That is not what it's saying. But above all, what? Taking the shield of faith. Here again is a choice. Did you pick it up? Did you bring it with you? Or did you leave it at home? Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able. Oh, man, if you haven't got those words highlighted, encircled, and X's and dots and all kinds of stuff, it says there, which you will be able to quench a few of the darts. Yeah, amen. See, you got to know what the word says. It says all the fiery darts of Satan. So there again, Paul is teaching us and sharing with us, as I am today, these these words of of power and authority that we've been talking about. These words of the kingdom, this kingdom life is the life we should be living and living. And this is all a part of the clothing that God has given us to put on. Because Jesus said, you're going to have trials and tribulations. Get over yourself. Everything, just because I'm the gift of peace, I'm the God of peace, doesn't mean you're going to walk in peace as long as you're walking on this earth. You can walk in peace, but peace is not going to be there all the time. We're going to have to fight for it. We see that in our life right now. The greatest nation on earth, God's gift to the world, the United States of America, founded on the word of God. 
proclaiming one God, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and freedom and justice for all. Come on, let's listen to those words. And where do we hear them today? You don't. You don't. Because our politicians don't want you to know what's rightfully yours. Don't want you to understand the favor of God, the principles of God, the goodness, the morality of our God. That's why they take our statues out. That's why they take all the parts of history. They don't want you to know history. See, without history, there's no foundation. All you have is the future, and you have no idea how to get where you're going because you have no past. See, I know what I was. I was a dirty old wretched man apart from God, but I'm not no more. I ain't. I ain't no more. I'm a new creation. I, I, I'm a child of the living God. I'm joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Each one of you are joint heirs. Man, we need to put on the Christ. Above all, taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench. Man, without this faith, you can't do it. Without understanding faith, that, that measure, the measure of faith that was given to each one of us by God. It's not something, that's why I've titled this the way I did. It's not about head knowledge. It's not the head knowledge of knowing God. It's the heart knowledge. Because see, in the heart, I know the, who I am in Christ. I know what God has provided for me. I know that by uh, studying and living the word, I can quench all the darts that he sends at me. Why? Because I know the word. Do I feel the pain? Yeah. Do I see things take place? Yeah. Am I worried? No. And I'm not. Why? Because I know who I serve. I know my destination. I know my future. My future has already seated me in heavenly places. In Christ Jesus. Don't ever forget those words. In Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 4.20, the Apostle Paul speaks of Abram's faith. We've read it all over, all over and over and over. Listen to this. It's in the English Standard Version. No unbelief. No under unbelief made him waver concerning the promises of God. Did you hear that? No unbelief. In other words, he did not doubt what God had promised. He didn't have a Bible to read. He didn't have the Holy Spirit living in him. And yet he stood his ground. No matter what came about. Now, was he a, a perfect man? No, we know he wasn't. But God honored him because of his faith in God. It's his faith in God. It never wavered. If God said it, I believe it, period. Hey, woman, pack your bags. We're leaving. Where are we going? Don't know. Following God. Well, what's up? What, what's, what's in our future? Don't know, but God's in charge. And he will not lead me into the valley of death. He won't leave me there. No unbelief made him waver, waver, waver concerning the promises of God. But he grew, listen to this, he grew strong in his faith as he gave God all the glory. Fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. Oh, people, we got to get a hold of this. If God said it, we need to believe it. We need to trust in what he said. See, if we still go back to that mindset, that soul man, see, I'm going to believe only what I can taste, feel, touch, smell, and, 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 and see. Because that's, what I'm, that's how I'm designed according to the failings or the falling away of Adam. See, that's the way everything has progressed. But now I'm a new creation. I've been transformed. I've been made anew. Man, we need to get excited about that. I believe there's more than it, more being strong than knowledge of what to do. Did you hear that? Than knowledge of what to do. Knowing how to achieve all that God promises and says that 
have been done for you and I through Christ Jesus. It's not just knowing God, it's knowing all these promises. I've been speaking and preaching about this table of grace. And from the beginning, all we ever seen was the bread and the wine. Because that's what we were taught. We come before this table of remembrance. And we look at the bread that symbols his body and the blood that is a symbol of his, of his I'm sorry, of his body and the, and the wine of his blood. But look at the rest of the table. And you can only see it with spiritual eyes because the word says it's there. All the promises of God are laid before us. You choose. Will you take it or will you leave it on the table? Faith is not head knowledge, it's heart knowledge. When we put on our armor, we activate, listen to this, we activate, activate the strength process by faith in those promises. Well, if God says, I'm ready, I'm equipped, he's fully equipped me for everything that I'm going to go through. We will re never realize the fullness of God's strength if we ignore the spiritual protection he offers. Because the battle is where? It's not in the physical. We don't battle against flesh and blood. Where do we battle? We battle in the heavenly places. Where we can't see it, taste it, smell it, touch it, and all that kind of stuff. See, that totally re removes the soul man. The soul man can't operate in that realm. That's why he said we must be spiritually minded, spirit minded, have faith in God. Whether we see it or not, have faith in God. It is always available, but we must always be plugged in. Everyone sitting here today has a cell phone. First thing you did last night before you went to bed is plug it in. Why? Because you knew you were going to use it today. And halfway through the day, if you didn't plug it in, what's going to happen? You lose it because there's no power. The battery must be recharged. It has to be plugged in. See, this is what Paul is saying to us in Ephesians here. Not only put it on, plug it in. Plug it into what? Into the word of God. Because the word is my strength. The word is my bond that God has given me, that he has made these promises, and he's going to keep them all. If I have faith, if I hold on to this shield of faith, no matter what I taste, feel, tell, or smell, and all that kind of stuff, doesn't matter what comes at me. My faith, my focus is on the Word of God. What does it say? See, this is where we lose because of bad teaching. And I say that with all compassion because I was wrapped up in that. I got caught up in that in my early days, in my early rising, that God doesn't do this and God doesn't do that unless you're a good boy. Well, that's not what it says. It's always available. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. My promises are all good. Have faith in me. We must get plugged in. In order to withstand the spiritual threats of our enemy, we must remain plugged in to the eternal source. This source, this word source has, has really taken on a, a different meaning in the last couple of weeks. Because there was something that happened in somebody's life. And as I prayed with those, with that family or over that family and with this person, you know, there, there, there's questions that take place. There's always questions. But where are you going to find the answers? That's the important part to your question. Where will you find the answers? We know that we'll always find the answers. Every My dad told me from the beginning of time, he said, whatever answer you need, you will find it in the Bible. And I said, so show me where one plus one is two. So he took me to Genesis. Adam. Eve, first there was one, then there was two, or there was another one added, so how many do you have, two? So, I, I mean, you know, that's all in fun. 
But what I'm saying is, is that every answer we need to all our questions in life are, are given to us right here. All we have to do is be plugged in. See, you, can, you have all the access to the Internet, every answer, everything concerning all worldly stuff. And we spend days and hours. We were at our dinner table last night and somebody picked up the phone. And my wife shouted out, no cell phones at the table. It's time for the family to talk. It is something that the family has learned not to do because of cell phones. But anyway, and because of the Internet. See, we go to the Internet for our source. When God says, this is the source. This is the true source. This is the truth and nothing but. Amen? In order to understand spiritual threats of the enemy, we must stay plugged in to the eternal source. Anyway, back to my story. And through the Spirit of God, the following day, I was sitting there praying and studying, and the Lord told me, she is not their source. I went, whoa! So what it was is that this prayer that was being, she was the, this person was the go-between. You know, you have the one that is in condition and the rest of the family, and this woman of faith was right in the middle, and they, they were, and I'm going to share some of this as I go on, but there, there's something that takes place, and right away we think we're their source. You are not their source. But you are the way to the source. You are not salvation, but you are the way to salvation. You are not all-knowing, but you're the way to all-knowing. Jesus has given us his name. And I hear us all saying it all the time. It's the name that's above every other name. I, I'm telling you, I, I want to I speak to your heart today. It's not just a name, because there truly is something about that name. That name that changes lives. That name that overcomes principalities and powers and wicked darkness. That's the name that overcomes those. It's not just a name. It's the name. It's the only name. It protects us from everything that the loser can try, listen to that, can try and throw at you. Who is the one called to be Sandy? All the way through here. We are. When you've done all to stand, the next verse says, stand. Stand therefore. So Satan wants us disengaged, thinking about what's going on out there. Thinking about the high price of gasoline. Thinking about, oh my goodness, diesel. Have you bought diesel lately? I mean, think about all this and going into the market and finding the shelves empty. Where, does, where are we engaged? Into our life. See, Satan wants us disengaged to the word of truth. He wants us disengaged from this spirit realm that God has placed us in of understanding spiritual things. He's given us his armor to protect us. Satan wants us disengaged and disinterested. That one's a powerful word if you think about it. Because we can become so easily interested or thought-minded about all this stuff. And when we're thinking about this stuff, we're not thinking about the promises of God. We're not thinking about the armor. We're not thinking about the blood. We're not thinking about all the gifts of grace that have been given to you and I as believers in Christ. It says we are to resist, and he will leave you. Do you believe that? Well, yeah, yeah, uh, 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, I know, I know it says that. No, you didn't hear me. Do you believe? See, this is the only way you're going to stand against the wiles, the deceit, the deceptions, and, and so forth, that this evil spiritual world is bringing at you. James 4, 7, one we all know. Submit. What does it, what does it mean to submit? It means surrender. Give it up. 
Get over yourself and get into the Word of God and let God rule and reign in your life. And He will never lead you wrong. He'll never lead you down a path that is shadowed, but one that always walks in the light. Listen to this. Submit to God. There's a choice. Did you hear the choice? Oh, man, so many times as I, as I teach and, and, and minister this, I want us to understand God always give you, gives us the choice. He's not sitting there with a hammer. Come on, boy, make a mistake. Come on, show me your weakness. No, that's not God. Where's the love in that? My own father never did that. My earthly father. Walk around waiting for me to make a mistake. Oh, he was there when I made one. But guess what? I don't make so many mistakes no more. James 4, 7 says, submit to God. Resist. Who has to do the resisting? Listen to what the word says. Resist, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Did you hear that? But see, we have to do the resisting. I got to learn to say, nope. No, I don't believe that. That's not what the word says. Well, you know, you're, you're, you're sick and, and God didn't heal you. I don't believe that. Why don't you believe that? Because that's not what the word says. I believe the word. My trust is in the word. See, what happens there is immediately the, 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 the temptation is removed. Why? Because of the shield of faith. See, I bring that up. Submit to God. Listen to Matthew 4, 9. You all recognize this. This is our living example. You hear me talk about this all the time. In verse 9, it says, And he, Satan, said to Jesus, All these things will I give to you. Here comes the key. If you will fall down and worship me. Oh, I'm out of time. I don't know how to dismiss it. All right, it just reset for 10 minutes. That must have been a God thing. I didn't do it. So anyway, understand. See, this was Satan. He could see him. He was tempted just like you and I are. But look, then Jesus said to him, how did he come back? I love this. Be gone. Read it. It's in Matthew 9, verse 11. Be gone. I'm sorry, verse 10. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord God and him only. See, the first thing he did is bring up that word, bring up that faith, and he stood on it. Watch what happens next in verse 11. As soon as he said that, the devil left him. And behold, angels from heaven came down and, and, uh, 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 and, and ministered to him. That's, that's, that's our God. Yeah, you went through a hard one, it, 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 and, but you stood your ground. You held on to the truth. You spoke the truth, and he left. How many times do you speak to Satan? Do you tell him and his little demons, out of here, dude, I don't believe in you. I believe in the living Christ. He's the one that died for me. I've been redeemed. He has given me the armor of God, and I've got it on. Satan wants us, again, to be disengaged and disinterested. Always the active word. I've told you this over and over. He's always after the active word. Satan was offering Jesus, listen to this. Satan was offering Jesus a compromise. It was a compromise. The same thing he does to us, he just did to Jesus. He offered him a, he offered him a shortcut. See, so you can still have all the world, but here's your shortcut. You don't have to suffer to get it. You bow down to me, and I'll give it to you because it's mine to give. And it was. It was his to give. But see, God doesn't believe in shortcuts. Jesus, praise God, did not take the shortcut. He did not take the easy way out. And he's saying to you and I, don't take the easy way out. He'll set before you a compromise, but don't be fooled. 
You must know the word of truth and stand. And when you've done everything to stand, keep standing. Satan was tempting Jesus to accomplish God's will, but not go through the plan of God. He still could have had the entire world, but it wasn't God's plan. That, can, that can't be done. The means is, an important, is as important as the end. How we get there is just as important as getting there. See, we're all going to heaven, those who believe. That's what the word says. But it's how we get there that's important. See, if we just sit back and go, whatever, God's in charge. He's, he's you know, he, he, he knows everything. And whatever he wants, it's, if it's God's will, I'm in on it. No, that's not what God said. I'm sorry. I'm ha- sorry to burst your bubble. That's not what God said. He says, now you go and have faith. See, if, if it was all about, about God, why would he give you all the armor? If you're not going to do battle because he's doing the battle, why would he give you armor? Why would he tell you to resist the devil if he's going to wipe the devil out? See, the church needs to understand that God never said, call on me and I'll handle Satan for you. No, God says, you stand. I have already equipped you with everything you need to withstand the temptation and the wiles and the darts and the sicknesses and diseases and the poverty. Everything in life, I've already equipped you to overcome it. He didn't say you won't go through it. He said, I've equipped you to overcome it. We need to learn to be overcomers. How? By the word. Go with me real quick. I know I'm, man, I was hoping to get done early. Go to Ephesians chapter one. We'll just do a couple of verses here. I want you to look at verse 19 of chapter one of Ephesians since you're already in Ephesians. But I saw none of those apostles except James. Am I in the right one? No, I mean Galatians. I went too far. Okay, here we go. I'm going, man, that don't sound right. Okay, verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power? Do you remember back there it says that we are to, we have the power to overcome the wiles of the devil? Listen. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us? It doesn't stop there. There's no period. Who believe. <laughs> and how do we believe? According to the work of his mighty power. His, pow- his word is his power, his strength, his authority. Remember it says in John, in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. Jesus is the word. He is the spoken word of God. He is the image of almighty God. He is everything that God is as flesh here on the earth. Amen? Look at, uh, continue on. His power toward us who believe according to the working of his more mighty power. So he does the working. All we do have to do is grab on to what he's already given us. Every spiritual blessing, every um, covenant blessing, all of it, not just the bread and the wine. Great, I'm glad we got the bread and the wine. But let me tell you, there's so much more that Jesus has provided. The work is done. We don't have to work. All we have to do is take what he's made available to us and then walk by faith. Look at verse 20. Which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the, uh, in heavenly places, far above. Far above what? Look at the next word. All. All what? Principality, power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. Do you remember what we read back over there in in chapter 6 of Ephesians? It said it listed all these, the enemy and and his, his wickedness, his evilness, and all these things that he uses against us to deceive us and take our minds off of the things of God and put it on your problems. And here it says, far above principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him, Christ, to be head over all things to, 
All things to, come on, say it. The church. <laughs> come on, you got to see this. See, it's not God's responsibility. It's ours. It's our responsibility to stand on the promises, to stand fully equipped with all the armor of God and the armor of faith and the word of God dwelling in us to stand and do the fight. And guess what? I'm going to cut it short. You win. We win. We, this is what we need to, we, 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 get, we get so involved in, in life that we forget that we're overcomers of this life. We're overcomers in Christ. He's equipped us. Paul was praying the world would get the revelation of power that we already have. It's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. You don't get more powerful than that. He's above all principality, power, might, dominion. And so are we. Why? We're his body. I, there is nobody in here with, that has a head but doesn't bring their body to church. It just don't work, right? So the head is the source that tells the body, tells me to raise and tick, move my finger, pick my ear, pick my nose. This moves because this says so. We need to understand that Christ is the head. What he has done, what he has provided, who he is, is more than enough to get through life and overcome all the schemes of Satan and his, and his uh, followers. The table of grace provides everything necessary in life, in this kingdom life, as joint heirs in Jesus Christ. See, once we get a hold of this, once we understand who we are in Christ Jesus, Satan hasn't got a chance. I didn't say you won't go through stuff. We must transfer our faith from human self-reliance. The soul man. Okay. Dismiss. I found it. Faith in the simplest, simplest definition is to trust or, reply or re rely or to depend upon a, a resource of another. I, I put in there most of us... Re re our biggest resource is me, me, myself, and I. And I believe many of us put God second. I already know where I'm going. I already know how I'm going to get there. I already know. And here comes the battle. And the next thing you know, when I get into the battle, the first thing I do is understand, wow, I'm losing. So what do I do next? Cry out to the one that should have been first. Faith is the simplest definition. God's words declared that the object of our faith is in Jesus Christ. And faith in Christ will never fail or disappoint you. Oh, man, I got so much more. But I'm going to end with this. We all learned from defeats. We know that. And losing can be used to make us better, stronger people. So don't get shook up when you get in the battle. Knowing that God is there right beside you. He's right there with you. And all you have to do is do like Jesus did. Speak the word and Satan flees. He has no power. Listen to me. He has absolutely no power against the word of God. That's why he's trying to steal it from you. Because it's power and authority in Christ. Real winners never plan to lose. There are many Christians, though, today who do plan to lose. And they will. I want to repeat what I said about what uh, Wigglesworth said. I'm not moved by what I see. And I pray as we continue in this series of understanding who we are in Christ and the authority and the power that's been given to each one of us who believe in the word of God and stand by faith, who stand fully equipped and ready for the good fight. And it is a good fight of faith. I am not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm moved only by what I believe. So I'm going to stand my ground. 
Amen? Amen. Well, I hope you got something out of that. Of course, you can't read and study the Word of God and not get something out of it because it's food to our spirit. It's strength to our spirit. It's understanding of who we are in Christ and that this Word is the most important thing that you and I have. It's right here. Because if we don't know what we're talking about, see, we can't take this and use it as our defense. See, that's what Jesus did. You, you, you come to Jesus, he's putting the word up. Go ahead, fight it. In fact, if it was me today, I'd say, go ahead, I dare you. Go ahead. See, I believe this. And then I start quoting this. I start turning to scriptures and I start speaking it over my problems, speaking it over my issues, speaking it over my pains on my differences and everything else. Start speaking the word of truth and watch how the word of truth will all of, all of, all of a sudden start to change the way we think because we start thinking like God thinks. I still say that's what he meant in Isaiah 55, 8, where he says, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts and everything. What he's saying is, come on up here. Because, see, I've already placed you in heavenly places in the New Testament under the new covenant of the blood. You're already placed in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You're sitting right next to Jesus. Take a quick look at him. Next time you're in a problem, next time you're in a situation, take a quick look and say, you're the one I trust. I know what your word says. And Satan, this is what it says. But don't forget to speak it. Don't just think it. He's waiting for you to speak it. Amen. God bless you.